beautiful aunties you could ever want, and uncles. <laughs> and more qualities that bring down fever, lower blood pressure, cure sunstroke, ease colds and coughs, soothe aches and pains, ease troubled minds, and even bring down blood sugar. And along with making medicines from these plants, our ancestors stayed healthy with the help of Cajun traiteurs. These are Cajun folk healers. Uh, it's a traditional, it's, it's a tradition, a custom that's been handed down through the generations. Many people get it from their family, a previous generation of the family. Other people, like myself, got it from someone in the community. Alan Seymour, please stand up, please. Be recognized. <laughs> he passed it on to me, and I've just always been so grateful. Thank you. You went hog wild. I went hog wild with it, right. So, um, we live in the capital of Cajun country here in Lafayette. But the slow decline of the Cajun French language appears to be accompanied by the fading of the traitor tradition until you put on a speaker series like this and realize how interested people still are in this ancient tradition. Um, but our speaker today is Colby A. Bear, whose pedigree as a Cajun and as a traitor is as good as it gets. The gift of healing was passed on to him by an older family member who doubtless got it from a previous generation and who knows how far back in history it goes. Uh, I'd like to mention too one thing. After our speaker series is over, if you wouldn't mind, go to the table back there if you have any stories or you can bring them up when Kobe takes questions because there will be another book that will be full of Story, these stories, I've heard some amazing stories that would curl your hair, even yours, <laughs> Alan. <laughs> um, so please uh, let us know if you have stories. And Kobe, in his talk, The Cajun Healer, Revival and Renewal, he will share his perspectives on how we can honor and strengthen that fading tradition while embracing the changes necessary to sustain it. So please welcome our speaker, Colby Davis. Yes, well, my ten. The first thing I'd like to do before I begin is make everybody in here a traiteur. So what you need to do is just turn your chairs around and face that way and you will have healed and treated my anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, it's all right. Thank, thank everyone who showed up and uh, being here, I really appreciate it. And, uh, but, but really before I start, I do want to mention that everything that I talk about is my uh, opinion my personal experience. This is such an ancient tradition. There are so many other people contributing to this tradition. And uh, there's a lot of different viewpoints and experiences. And so everything I talk about is not, you know, meant to be considered factual or uh, from like an authoritative perspective. Um, but I, I would like to speak, you know, freely from my own experience. Um, my name is Colby Bear. I'm from New Iberia, Louisiana. Don't hold that against me. Um, my hair might not look like it, but I'm basically a New Iberian ball. I go, if you don't know what that means, just go on YouTube. Uh, but, you know, basically I was born and raised there. And um, as a result, uh, I kind of feel like I kind of am the, the epitome of like a New Iberian Cajun. You know, I have uh, mostly Acadian, French, and a few other things speckled in, but a little generous portion of Spanish in me. Um, but you know, in this culture of South Louisiana, we all are that way. We share, uh, you know, a, a mixture and a melting pot of, uh, within our DNA. So that's one of the things that makes 
that makes South Louisiana beautiful is its diversity. When I was uh, growing up, I had uh, what a lot of people would probably consider to be a pretty typical childhood in South Louisiana. I, uh, I grew up on coffee, milk, and kush kush. <laughs> Listening to my grandparents speak French, you know, with my mom. And, uh, mostly because they didn't want us to know what they were saying. You know, we all know that. French is coming back now. That's a good thing. A great thing. But, you know, um, in that sense, I had a very uh, typical childhood. So, for occasion, you know, I had a, a mother, uh, two grandmothers, you know, grandfathers who were very devout people, father too, uh, you're just faithful people, you know, uh, always seeing the way that they, that they viewed life was always connected to the spirit, you know, to God, you know, honoring God, it sort of reignited a little bit of my interest in it, you know, in, in that tradition that I was, uh, you know, possibly a part of. So, um, years go by, and then, you know, um, I, I start up various ventures, uh, most notably uh, making hats. Uh, I started making hats in New Iberia, and then I moved up to the city, and I made hats in New Orleans for three years. And the whole time, my focus and emphasis, because it was just so natural to who I was my whole life, was Cajun preservation, cultural preservation, South Louisiana, cultural preservation. And how can I do that, you know, with a hat? <laughs> it's, it's a task, but I figured it out. Um, you know, just expressing through the, the designs that we do, elements of South Louisiana culture, you know, geography, um, you know, and, and trying to use those things to instill pride in the Cajuns that wear them, or the Cajun, you know, lotteries. But while I was living in New Orleans, the spirit really, you know, started coming back over me, pulling me to get back into touch, you know, with that tradition, with that part of myself. So I went on an explorative journey uh, spiritual life, I did that, you know, I grew up Roman Catholic, you know, but, you know, um, I've never been afraid to just uh, read, you know, things. So I wasn't unfamiliar with other things, uh, concepts of spirituality growing up, like Buddhism, what have you. Um, but in New Orleans, you know, I felt this, this, this gravitas that comes with the healing, just as a, as, a, as a modality through life, is so big, you know, so, so vast, so far beyond uh, any one culture. And the way that we did it in our culture seemed to me to be so simple uh, that it was almost underwhelming. Just say a prayer or something, you know. So I think I, I felt I've got to, there has to be so much more to this. I need so much more uh, to be able to employ in my arsenal of, you know, how I would approach healing, you know, working with the spirit. Uh, and I think, I think that still is present among, from, from what I hear from a lot of people is that they just want more. They want to know that some, there's so much, there's got to be so much more to it that, that I haven't been, haven't found out yet, you know. So I explored those things in other cultures, you know, different healing pathways in other cultures and other places uh, throughout history, throughout the span of time and history. And just kind of informed myself and opened myself up to that, you know, uh, to that knowledge and experience. And where it led was ultimately, um, I went as far out in every direction as I possibly could. And then I moved right back. You know, I moved right back to New Iberia in 2020 and decided that 
the only way that I can really properly take an active role in the preservation of the culture in Acadiana is from within. So I moved back, my wife and my older son, and um, went full force back into the roots of the tradition to discover the tradition that is the Trecha, the South Louisiana healer. So, enough about me and more about the tradition, but what is a Trecha? You know, just defining that, like can we really, you know, because there's so many people who define it in so many different ways. So, through my experiences, this is what I've come to understand. First of all, a traiteur is a South Louisiana healer. Multiple uh, religions, right? Religious beliefs, multiple ethnic backgrounds, a plethora, a diversity of background, all with so much to contribute to the tradition in unique ways, but yet all simultaneously under this umbrella of similarities, you know, that can connect us to one another. The word traiteur, on the other hand, you know, obviously it's a French word and it goes back, you know, I mean, pretty much medieval France, I don't know how far before that, and the word was used in to describe a healer in rural parts of France, and it is today as well. It still is used in France today in, in rural areas. It also just means sort of a culinary caterer. Um, the Paris doesn't count. So, essentially, it's it's an amalgamation. You know, it's a a contribution of experiences and of knowledge over the course of several hundred years here in the deep south of Louisiana. And anyone who's a part of that deserves to be recognized as a traiteur, despite the fact that methods can vary. I think another one is that today, I kind of hear people in when today's day and age locally will say things like, you know, I work with herbs and plants and natural medicine, uh, remedies, etc. And I'm from South Louisiana. I was born here, uh, or I've dedicated myself here for quite some time. I'm, you know, connected to the spirit of the culture. Am I a traiteur or a traiteuse? And I think they're asking that because they're aware that there's a lot of times, if not most, this sort of tradition of, you know, working with the spirit in the sense of saying these prayers, passing things down, you know, laying on of hands, not just working with, with plants, which often coincides. So I think it's proper, uh, or at least deserving, to make and perhaps embrace designations for those individuals because I think that in short, the answer is yes, of course. If you are a healer and you are a part of this culture and you're contributing to this culture, um, you should be able to call yourself a meditator and perform your healing work in ways that would be most in sync with the traditions that we pass down, you know, and and that's fair. I um, kind of thought about it, and I think it would be simple to say that if you don't cross over from one or the other, working with the spirit, you know, the prayers, or just simply working with the pray the plants, I don't mean to say simply as to undermine that work, but I would call it uh, a traiteur de zab, or a traiteur de zab, you know, an herbal healer. It's very simple, you know, or a traiteur d'esprit, you know, traiteur d'esprit, a, a, a healer of, you know, the, with the spirit, you know, a prayer healer. Um, 
but it doesn't matter, you know, if you don't want to uh, make those designations or not. The point, in, the case in point is that it's, it all counts. Um, I think in most cases, regardless of what you've been passed down or this or that, um, we kind of cross over into both of those. Those of us who, who pick up, you know, this tradition of healing, we kind of dabble in both areas, you know. We're spiritual, we pray, you know. Uh, we know how to make a toddy, you know, when you're under the weather. So, I called this uh, Revival and Renewal, Cajun Healer Revival and Renewal for a reason. Um, I think it just insinuates that we should take more of an active effort so, as we kind of steer into that, I just want to talk a little bit more about kind of establishing for those who are interested, um, maybe a bit more about the tradition of, of being a traiteur itself, you know, what that is. So, some of the questions that we often ask are, are you born with it? Is it a gift? You know, does it come from God? You know, what's the source? For me, uh, I think it goes both way and every way. Um, you know, anyone can do this, you know, just like anyone can swing a bat and play baseball, you know. I think though, on the other hand, you know, and at the same time, with anything in life, what makes up a balanced ecosystem, which makes up a, a, a functional community, or when you sort of have different integral parts, you know, all being brought to the table to kind of form, you know, make sure that all the bases are covered with what everyone needs. You know, that's one of the reasons that we're all unique, you know, and some of us, you know, have certain aspects of our personality or natural inclinations, talent-wise, that allow us to contribute something that may be something that only we can contribute. So with that being said, I, I, I do feel, uh, but again, maybe this is because it's only my experience, you know, but I do feel that you can sort of kind of be born with it, you know, um, it, it, just in the sense that some people kind of are naturally inclined, it comes to them, very easily to be able to be kind of in tune, you know, spiritually and understand those things and kind of be effective in those areas. But maybe you haven't accepted that early on in your life, you know. It doesn't mean that you just you just haven't had that as an aspect of your nature, you know, all along. So I kind of look at it as a, as, a, as a gift or as something that you're born with, but nothing that anyone else can't attain or be a part of either. Um, I mean, we're all just tied to that same source, to that same spirit, you know, that's how we're all connected. Um, but we all have roles, you know. Um, and some of us, I suppose, are called to be a little bit more aggressive or active um, in helping others in our community with that type of work beyond just ourselves, our you know, our families, you know, and, the, and what we what's needed under our roofs. So, which brings me to the you know the next point or question that's often asked, which is, is it passed on? You know, does it have to be passed on, and how is it passed on? And again, both ways. You know, I think that. There's something very special and real about a moment when someone acknowledges something from within another individual and encourages them and places intention over them by praying or just sharing. And I think there is power there. You know, so I'm not 
by any means taking away from the tradition of passing on and passing down uh, the gift. I kind of just said, I think you might also be born with it, just or just innately able to do this. And what I mean by that is, you know, I guess I would sort of look at my grandmother as someone who gave me permission. She made me feel confident. She made me feel comfortable. And she told me what to do. It's as practical as that. She told me what to do, you know. We'll go back on, on, on this point later of when, how do I know I'm an actual, you know, I'm a traitor. Well, in simplest terms for me as a child, well, my grandmother was a traitor, that's what they said. I believed it. She told me I was a traitor. Okay, I guess I'm a traitor. You know, it was real simple. And in that simplicity, which was a big part of the earlier phases and stages of, you know, Acadian and Creole settlement, you know, here in Louisiana in the earlier days, simplicity came a profound and inherent <coughs> power and significance and, and importance. You don't have, we don't have to break it all apart and figure it all out scientifically because some, some things you just can believe because you choose to, you know, someone shared that with you, you were told that, and that can be enough, that, that's good enough. And, and as a child, for me it was, for most of the generations, if not probably all before me, I think it was, it was enough to just accept it and believe it, we didn't have to figure it out. But it's okay for us to do this now because today is not yesterday. And we as a society and a culture, are not the same as yesterday's society uh, or yesterday's culture. And that's not a bad thing. I always say when it comes to Cajun preservation that it's about redefining it if you want it to survive. But the, the point in that is that we get to choose. We don't just let go of the reins and be upset or you know, concerned or burdened with what we think is just a culture that's dying away and falling apart. Instead, we just redefine it. What, how can we be as Cajun, as Creole, and to everything else in South Louisiana, as much as possible today? How can we, we uh, you know, bring that to life, embody that? I think part of it, a big part of it is, is awareness, but again, it's also in honoring tradition, but redefining it so that it's relevant and that it works for what we need today. Another one would be, um, you know, like I said, where does it come from? Do we need to believe in God? in order to do this work? Well, in some form or another, I feel like it's more likely than not that the people here under this roof believe in some form of God or higher power or creator or spirit. Otherwise, maybe you wouldn't be here. I don't, I don't know, but it's the spirit of God, you know, moves us as far as us. And so personally, uh, I think that I'm not going to say it's required because I, I, I don't know all the answers. I know my experience. My experience is that I have to believe in a higher power. I have to believe in God, and I choose to. And that from Him, from that source is where all things flow. And that's the only reason my faith in the tradition because I choose to believe that it works is what allows me to become that conduit and to allow God to flow through me in times of need 
Please just get it out of his way, you know. But so, so I, I you know, I don't want to be the authority to say you have to believe in God for this to work. But that's what I think it is. I think it's the creator, you know, I think it's the creator spirit, you know, the almighty that flows in everything. Have you seen the movie Avatar? <laughs> For me, it's it's kind of how I picture life, you know, around me. Like the movie, if you haven't seen it, it's just that everything is alive. Every single thing around us is alive, and is alive with God's spirit, and it's what connects us all, you know. So, forms of spiritual uh, experiences that I've studied uh, different philosophies. You know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and as I'm sure most of you know, there are healing traditions and practices across the entire world and all throughout time. They're all very effective. They always have been. It's ancient. I, I sort of look at the traitor tradition um, a bit like mysticism um, or a bit like a simply a surrender. In other words, as compared to some of the other spiritual practices and traditions around the world, I think that the, typically in our tradition as Trentos, we don't seek to control, we don't seek to make it about us or choose an outcome or a situation or what to do, etc. But rather surrender and show up. You know, just sort of open ourselves up and accept what someone else needs and just get out of God's way and allow God to work through us without any concern about what's taking place or what the outcome may be because oftentimes Maybe the person who's receiving the gift is, uh, or, the, or the treatment is being blessed in some manner that has nothing to do with what, what, they, what they asked you to address. Um, so it's, it's up to, you know, it's God's will, you know, and that's just how I see it. And, and the reason I'm explaining this, um, to be clear, is because Personally, again, I've experienced a lot of individuals around Acadia today who are really just interested in knowing, well, what makes a traitor different, right, from, you know, other healing traditions? Because it, it's been such a secretive and elusive tradition for so long. So these are just some of my experiences and opinions on kind of understanding a threta as opposed to other spiritual practitioners um, or whatever you want to call it. For those who feel that they maybe should be a healer or work with this, maybe you've had someone in the family, you know, one thing that's always, you know, coming up is how do I become the, when do I, you know, how do I, what do I do, who do I, you know, approach. And when do I feel comfortable, you know, knowing and accepting that this is what I do or what I am. So for me, it was kind of in, I guess, three stages, but some of the, those things I kind of recognize in hindsight, or at least that's sort of how I look at it. But one is, that first I feel that I just had that innate, uh, innately in my nature is something that kind of came natural to me. I, you know, I expressed that earlier, so that's sort of just, that's number one. It sort of was just there, you know, already. You know, I was called to it, I was interested in it, and that was for a reason. It was, it was set in me. Um, and then, through an experience that I had with my cousin and following, you know, the experiences that I had with my grandmother, 
it was acknowledged, you know, it was sort of awakened. So that was for me kind of this, the next stage, which I think is probably the, you know, the most important is for us to acknowledge something, to be aware of something. Otherwise, how can we move forward doing that type of work if we're not aware of it, if we don't acknowledge it, if we ignore it, you know, if we don't accept it. So it was kind of awakened in that sense at that time. And then, you know, for me, I guess thirdly, because again, I went many, 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 many years. I'm 32, by the way. And uh, like I said, I was about 11 or 12, so about 20, 21 years or so ago. And again, I went mm -hmm. more than a decade without really paying much attention to it or just really addressing it. But again, I was young. When I was living in New Orleans and went on that pursuit, you know, and spoke with different spiritual leaders in a variety of areas, but then ultimately called back home and spoke to a few kooky traitors from back home who are still very significant to me. I started to embody it, you know? And I think that for me, that's important to acknowledge is that we may all go through a stage of questioning confidence, you know, is this real? How do I know if this works, etc. But once you just get all of that out of your head and you just, you say, well, if this is, it keeps coming up. <laughs> You know, it must be for a reason. So I'm just going to accept it. You know, I'm just going to embody it and just be it and just start doing it. And then I dispelled all of those concerns. Once I chose to do that, I was already passionate about my roots and my culture and trying to figure out how I could preserve that that naturally, I go, well, I'm actually a part of this tradition that's really a pillar of, of our culture. Um, maybe I should be focusing my preservation efforts on that. You know, and it just was a very natural um, transition. So then, you know, despite whatever it was that I was doing and, and whatever it is that I'm still doing, avec chapeau, uh, the hats, I, um, started feeling the need to put my efforts toward this, and that started with well, how do we how do we uh, preserve a tradition in the first place? You know, that's like a big question. Uh, I kind of started with oh, maybe we could make a database of trade terms online. That way, it's not like do you do you know somebody who can do this? Well, let me ask Bobette, and then she asked you know Suzanne. And so forth, so on and so forth, and the next thing you know, Leroy uh, comes to treat you. But, but that kind of already was starting to take place. There were different forms, of, uh, and there are different forms of um, databases and things like that that you can, you know, access tractors, you can find tractors. So um, later, it kind of became placed uh, on on my heart to maybe write a book. You know, but we'll get back on that because what, what I want to do is to be able to help um, the rest be able to take an active role in preserving the, the tradition within our culture. So we'll kind of get back to that revival and renewal of a culture. And how do you preserve, like I said? So one aspect of that is awareness, you know? bringing awareness to the tradition, reminding people, enlightening people, and sharing with people who have no clue that this is even a thing uh, of, of, the, of this beautiful tradition and how accessible it is. There's plenty of, there's plenty of traders around, trust me, um, and plenty that are around that don't even know that they, you know, would be great at, you know, adopting that as a practice in their life. 
So back to what I said about redefining tradition, the next thing to preserve it would be first of all to honor it. So what I mean by that is, you know, when we honor tradition, it's to say what aspects of what was done can we try to preserve in a way that we keep them the same? You know, um, things should evolve. Uh, things should evolve or everything would probably crumble, but, but there's a lot within the history of the tradition and how things were done and have been done for a long time that's very important and that is relevant and that should be honored, you know? A, a quick and simple example is that if I, if I have a prayer that was given to me in French, but then there's an English translation, I'm gonna say the French, you know? And that's just my choice, but it's just one simple way to keep something a certain way to, to, to allow an aspect of that tradition to persevere through time. But another thing, about pres uh, preserving is, is, like I said, allowing that evolution, allowing room for change, being open for things to grow and evolve and to be done differently and to be enhanced. You know, I'm sure that in the 15th, 16th, 17th century, they never thought that people would be treating on Facebook, you know? But, <laughs> I, I treat more people on Facebook through Facebook Messenger than anywhere. Um, and I keep saying, you know, lately, you know, if it's not life threatening or, uh, you know, if you have the means, why don't you come and see me? Because you know, there's something special about that, that old school human connection. Something that you can't change by that. So, so that is one perspective on how to preserve tradition is to honor the old ways, to carry with you as much as you feel is pertinent, but also to be open to the fact that we can figure out new ways or allow new things into, into the tradition. Tradition, in order to, to be sustained, has to still be alive. Not just something we look at as some thing that was done in the past. It has to still be living and breathing and in operation. And so that's why it's so important to take that decisive perspective that I'm going to redefine things. But um, so I won't preach too much about that. But nonetheless, I think that, you know, the early, our ancestors um, who took part in this tradition were people of faith, strong faith, whatever that was to them. They possessed it, they had it, they were believers. That faith is a big part of the resilience which led to, you know, all of us being here. And, you know, as a result, I think that the the, the tradition of being a traiteur is, you know, I don't know, maybe maybe the most significant as, as it pertains to how it relates to that spirit, that faith, that resilience. Music does that, you know, it does. Music heals, you know, it brings on the spirit. Food does, food definitely does, I always say it. Well, there's nothing that makes me feel more like a sacred or spiritual thing than when I'm just cooking some smothered chicken or something like that. Um, preferably black iron. Uh, but, but so yeah, it's just establishing that it's important. And, and kind of accepting that, you know, it helps to also understand in order to avoid, or maybe just for the sake of awareness, why did it become... You know, why did it fall out of, you know, fashion or use, you know? And, and a lot of us know that that's related to the, the introduction of, you know, pharmaceuticals in the medical industry, you know, the medical field and just uh, modern medicine, you know. Um, a lot of that made things uh, easy, more easily accessible and, 
you know, it was it just blew up in such a way that people really just went that direction because it seemed like, you know, such an academically authoritative way to address anything that was in need of healing, you know, and, and it is useful. Um, but like Mary said, coinciding with the, de the decline of speaking French, I think there was also a suppression to it. You know, and again, this is my experience. People who stopped uh, sharing uh, French with their children and grandchildren and teaching them that had gone through experiences where it seemed like it wasn't necessarily the most comfortable thing to just have French as the first language that she spoke. You know, well, with the Trinitarian tra tradition, uh, like I said, this is ancient. The healing tradition is ancient. And not only does it far predate any particular religion or faith, but I think that in some cases, uh, and again, like I said, I grew up uh, Roman Catholic and I, uh, you know, still, uh, I mean, I was in Mass every day for a minute. Not that that matters at all. Uh, my point is, is that so I'm not pointing fingers at any particular religion or faith, but sometimes what can happen is because of our attachment to, you know, certain ideologies or beliefs, we can get a little leery about and cautious about some of the things that are just ancient traditions. And without a doubt, I think that that is naturally what was likely going on throughout uh, several hundred years of this tradition. As a result, I feel it was probably watered down in a way, you know, because, you know, we hear lots of times, it's just prayers, you know, and that's good. But, uh, no, it's not. <laughs> Have you ever heard of a potato being uh, with a breath of fresh air, with a new perspective? And the same thing should happen with, with this tradition. And that's when, what I would call renewal. Renewal is the replacing or repair of something that's worn out or broken. I'm not suggesting that the tradition is broken. Um, but nonetheless, perhaps we could bring back and renew and restore some of the richly accompanied, accompanying aspects of the tradition that have fallen out of favor or, you know, been kind of watered down to just, you know, da -da 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 -da. <laughs> prayer or this or that. I mean, there's the tradition. Um, and it doesn't have to, but again, those are some of the things that make our tradition unique. And Perhaps we can also be open-minded, you know, in, in considering revival or renewal, sorry. Perhaps we can be open-minded to, are there things that haven't been a part of this tradition or the things that we haven't done before that can possibly be performed or done or included in the tradition, enhancing it. So, I think number one is to accept that those changes, those newer things that you know are, are being done, uh, newer perspectives, fresher perspectives on the tradition. I think first of all is to accept that that's good and that that's okay. We should hold on to some of the older aspects of the tradition and keep those things alive. But anyone who is taking part in redefining this tradition, i.e. every one of you here, uh, should be acknowledged as being a part of that renewal, you know, and as being authentic in who you are and what you do, if you should choose to associate yourself 
as a traitor or traitors, um, you know, and, and trying to become a part of that practice and a part of that tradition. If you're taking effort, you know, you're authentic. You are authentically a part of a living, breathing chapter of this tradition. So that's important to acknowledge and to understand. You know, being open-minded without hindrance, but again, remaining uh, honorable and a good word is reverent towards some of the traditions that already exist, uh, if not most of it. You know, uh, saying that because it isn't done a certain way, that's a way that someone else was used to it being done, what I, I would say would be, uh, you know, a, a way of thinking that would suppress and stifle its growth, you know, so, uh, so what are, what are some of those things, you know, some of those, those just things that we know about the tradition? Well, typically we say it goes from a man to a woman or a woman to a man. Um, I've seen it happen otherwise. We say most times that it's probably a generational thing that, you know, descends through family lineage. I know many people who have taken part in this tradition because someone from outside of their family or even outside of their culture brought them into it. Um, another thing that we say is that, you know, you can't uh, treat over a body of water for this particular thing. I've seen it happen. And that's okay. All of those things are still valid, and they were for the time and, and how they were practiced, and depending on who you are. Every person who takes a part of this tradition, the way that they express it, the way that they experience it, and the beliefs that they have and the opinions that they have surrounding it, are for the most part authentic, like I said, really equally authentic, because it's okay to be different and to see things differently. Now, in renewing something, some of the examples of things that I personally have uh, thought about or experienced that I would say uh, I found kind of something I can adopt uh, as enhancing the tradition. Well, and then, again, this was done before, technically, but my great, or literally, but my great-great-grandmother, she, she has treated things like inanimate objects, like a cloth, and used the cloth to then be transferred to the particular person or thing or animal that needed to be treated, and then the treatment was transferred. So then what else can I do, you know? Can I use waters and salts and healing oils? Can my staff mean anything at all? Maybe to me symbolically, you know. But nonetheless, it's being open-minded to how can we take some of those aspects of tradition and allow for them to be enhanced so that we can do more. So that we can do we can do more. Should you take payment? Should you should you accept a thank you? Traditionally they say no, you know. Um, I accept that aspect of the tradition. Um, particularly because I think, like I said earlier, where I sort of in my mind and in my experience equate the traiteur more to be, be akin to something like a mystic or mysticism, it, because I have to surrender, I have to get myself to where it's nothing to do with me at all. So then that acknowledgement kind of gets in the way of that. So that's my experience. But um, I can't say that that's wrong, you know, uh, for anyone. Saying thank you, by the way, it's very natural. <laughs> you know how difficult it is for so many people when we treat to to not do that. <laughs> you know, and they'll thank you. Oh, you know, and then and I'm like, it's, don't worry about it. It's not going to my head, and it's still going to work if it's supposed to. Don't worry about it. Um, but you can say God bless you next time. You know, just because that feels if you want to, whatever. Um, so. You know, we all are a part of different religious backgrounds, spiritual focuses, beliefs, etc. Uh, traditionally, uh, Acadians were very devout Catholics. You know, the, the, the star on the Acadian flag literally represents the Blessed Virgin Mary, so that kind of tells you how devoted they were to the, to the Catholic religion and to Mary and all of that. And, you know, uh, that again, there are many South Louisiana healers who are not 
associated with Catholicism or even Christianity, and that's just as good. But but you know, I just come from that tradition that uh, grew up Catholic. So for me, uh, the use of an altar, burning candles for intentions, saying different prayers and things like this uh, in honor of someone, you know, petitioning to God. You know, that's something that I personally. Uh, have adopted, you know, as a as a part of my practice, but it's also something that has been been being done for a long time. Uh, Marie Laveau went to Catholic church. She went to mass every single day. She was very devout. She had an altar in the parlor of her home with the Catholic uh, icons on it. And uh, you know, from some of the resources that I've experienced and read, was actually more of a threat than what you might consider a Buddha queen. And I'm not saying that again as to undermine. Whoever is involved in voodoo, but particularly, uh, you know, it's it's a it's an old tradition, just full practice of incorporating things into your spiritual connection and the work that you do. Um, so you can find in your own way uh, what works for you. Because everyone uh, that I come across it, so frequently when we have this conversation brings up that they were a part of the. Uh, the, the, the tradition was a part of their family and they feel a connection to it, but they never got to experience that um, before that person was deceased. Um, for me, that's one of the main motivations why I decided to write a book as sort of a guidebook, um, you know, just empowering and helping people who feel like they just don't have anyone to teach them or show them or make them understand. So I'm going to do a really small uh, segment that I will call uh, Tremol 101 uh, in the size. But before I do that, uh, do we have time for a few questions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so a few, but uh, we'll start wherever uh, if anybody has any questions about anything in a way that makes it the way that our culture does it. So I'll give you some pointers. And let me also say that. Uh, how do I know that I'm supposed to be a traitor? How do I know that it works? Another thing to pay attention to is, you know, if you keep getting called, if you keep being interested, if you keep if you keep getting that nudge, you know, forward, that draw, that interest being sparked, being enlightened, uh, there's probably something to pursue there. Otherwise, it'll probably just fizz out if it's not for you. I mean, it's for you for a little while. I don't know. Number one, there's a number and a rhythm to it. It's not always the same, but in most healing traditions, there's a number or a rhythm in some form. In ours, it's mostly using the number three. We usually say the same prayer three times. If we feel called to, or some people do it every time, we say that prayer another three times. And then another. So in other words, three rounds of three, so nine. Some people do more than that. Some people just sit there and do 15 right off the bat. No, thank you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, so in between there, there's typically the sign of the cross being made. And then I'm going to say those three, those that prayer three times. Maybe it's said for the person with their name. Maybe it's said over the person. Maybe lying hands on the person. Maybe holding your hand over the part of the person that needs healing or treatment. Maybe making three crosses over that part of the person or over the, in, or the, over the individual while saying those prayers three times. A lot of what I do does go off of and is based on in, off of intention. So for example, um, sometimes I may say two rounds and then I'm done. Sometimes I may say one, and then I'm done. And then sometimes, like I said, I may do three full rounds. But at some point, in my experience, I have to say, this is enough. You know, this is good enough. You know, because then I'm not equating the work that's being done to the power that's being, that God is bestowing. It's, you know, the, the two are not, we can't compare it to that way anyway. I don't, for the sake of time, I don't want to expand on that too much, but my point is, is that, you know, then it becomes my efforts that are, what's important and that's not the case. Um, and then, you know, the other big thing is, uh, what are the prayers? Um, I do have a lot of prayers and I think it's important that when
when you have a prayer, uh, or at least significant, that when you have a prayer or uh, a treatment, if you, if you don't choose to call it a prayer, if you have a treatment and you want to, uh, you know, know which one to use for this and that, first of all, a lot of prayers specifically say what they're treating. Um, and I think there's a lot of importance and significance in using the prayer that has already been designated for that particular thing. Because those words have been uttered tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands or millions of times. And there's a gravity, you know, there's a snowball effect of just that energy that those words are significant. That's why there's, you know, there can be power in words, but just these amount of times they've been uttered. So, uh, you know, so there's, there's those specific prayers. And then I might say, okay, well, someone's, uh, someone's got some kind of inflation or some kind of whatever, but maybe I have a, a prayer for spraying. Well, I think in my brain, it's like something that's sort of swelling or inflamed or, you know, so I'll kind of use the sprain prayer on something that uh, I feel is similar. So that's kind of how my mind operates. But then again, of course, there are also prayers where the prayer or the words, the treatment doesn't designate anything specifically in reference to a certain ailment or malady. Therefore, maybe it can be used for anything and everything if that's what you feel. And then there are the prayers that are sort of good old fill in the blanks. And you just put in ailment and you put in for who, you know? If it feels like it's good enough for you, then, you know, it's good enough for God, I think. Uh, or for the spirit to work, for the tradition to work. And, um, and so that, you know, so, so that being said, now personally, and, and this is in kind of closing is personally, I... Uh, when I do three rounds of prayers, I may say a, a little something in between each one just to kind of give me that pause to kind of put some more reflection back on what it is that we're working on for who, kind of giving that intention. And then uh, I always sort of have a closing. And I think a lot of traditions do this where we say those prayers and then at the end we kind of just pray on them a little bit. You know, we kind of just say what comes to our mind or sometimes we have a bit of what might be something that's kind of scripted but it's just it's just how we bring things to an end and then we express gratitude to God. So what I'd like to do before I finish make a prayer. So I just want to make this accessible to people who are like, what do I do? You know, I want to be a trick to I don't have any information. Okay, so we're going to make a prayer. But before we do that, I'll just say find a mentor. That's important. That's important. That's a big part of the tradition. So, uh, in my tradition, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Or, So, what would be a thing uh, that, that we need to treat? Okay? And what would be a name? Well, a good name is Boudreaux. Okay? <laughs> and I'm not doing that to be a reverend. It's just like for us, you know, Jones. Uh, thank you. Heat stroke, Boudreaux. Actually, that's a good point. You know, today, you know, might be a big heat stroke day uh, this weekend. So, Boudreaux and heat stroke. So, it may be something as simple as to say, uh, God, I ask you to treat Boudreaux for the heat stroke. God, I ask you to treat Boudreaux for the heat stroke. God, I ask you to treat Boudreaux for the heat stroke. And maybe because it's a heat stroke, you lay your hand over his head or something along those lines. And you say it three times again. And, and it's very much that simple. But if prayers are said to sh that they should be secretive or kept secret or that they shouldn't be shared, is there something to that well, just the same as family recipes, in my opinion. So I have a lot of prayers that I might share, but maybe I won't share my grandmother's prayer to anyone that's not, you know, a descendant of me, because it's just, it's just special. It's just my grandmother's prayer. It's part of my family, you know. So, um, sorry, but you're not getting my smothered chicken recipe. <laughs> but there's plenty to share. There's plenty to go around. Nonetheless, um, I'm very grateful that all of you came to listen. Um, I'm very passionate about my culture, that's the only reason that I'm here. I just want to contribute. I want traditions to be sustained. If there's any way that, that I can help in doing that, 
Um, I'm making myself available. I love being a part of this culture. I love being a part of South Louisiana. Um, thank you to everyone for showing up. Thank you, Mary, and for inviting me, and to Ellen for uh, facilitating this as well, and for Millionville. It, to me, is an honor to be able to speak at a place as esteemed as this. And um, the name of the book that I'm going to be writing is The Cajun Healer, a guidebook for the trade tour and training. Uh, it isn't finished yet, but there is a Facebook page called The Cajun Healer Trade Tour Registry. That's just something that down the road is going to kind of coincide with the promotion of the book. Um, that being said, again, thank you, uh, and God bless everyone that's here. Also, by the way, I have cards. Um, if anyone would need to reach out to me for a treatment um, or for anything else, um, I did have cards on the table. I prefer an email unless it's something that needs to be dealt with uh, immediately. And, um, you know, I'll be hanging out a little bit after, but um, we're going to save the treating and things like that if possible for contacting me to facilitate something this week or in the following week. Seriously, thank everyone so much. I'm very honored.